That's very good. Well, we're glad to have you with us. We have um, in the autumn and then again in the spring, a series of uh, classes on Tuesday morning. Um, traditionally, at the end of this series, we have a, a luncheon, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. and was not far out. And I'm, I'm working right now in putting together a Ukrainian themed luncheon so we can, we can see what we can get uh, going with that. I, I do have one dish that I do really well. It's a Ukrainian stew. So we'll, we'll work on that. But on, um, in this particular series of lessons, we've been looking at the, the covenants this week, it'll be the National Covenant, but the idea of covenants going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and actually we could have gone before because there was definitely a covenant with the angels that they did not keep their place and were punished. But with all of these, we do find that there is, there's change, but there's profound continuity there's a cumulative effect among these covenants. And this really reaches back to the idea of the nature of God. God doesn't change. He's not one God today, and he's going to be a different God tomorrow. He doesn't change. Now, human beings change. Um, sometimes the change is gradual and you, you think about growth. Sometimes there's a strong disjuncture, but God does not change. And as a result, the covenants are never trashed. God doesn't say of a covenant, wow, I made a mistake doing it that way. Throw that on the trash heap. Let's go to something else. Instead, Every covenant, every promise of God is eternal. God does not change his mind. He doesn't promise and then take back. But there can be additions. As we think in terms of a legal document, a codicil. Not something new, but something that amplifies or restricts or directs. But the cumulative nature, we find that in Leviticus 26, 42, God says, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will, will remember the land. <coughs> now, is there one covenant with Jacob and a completely different disjointed covenant with Isaac? And yet a third completely different and non-connected covenant with Abraham. <clears throat> no, God made a covenant with Abraham. It was reaffirmed with Isaac. It was reaffirmed with Jacob. And it was enlarged over the time. It was explained more fully. And that's the same covenant with the land. <clears throat> Now, whenever we think about the land, I want to just obliquely say God does care about his physical creation in every form. And he does care about the environment. He does care about nature. Uh, he tells us that. But in this instance, land is a reference to the people. Joel 2, 18, then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. It's really thinking about a covenant with the nation. Whenever we look at the idea of the covenant with the nation, we recognize that what occurred in the old provides for us, and we'll see later some lessons we can draw for the new, but it was with a very definite 
group of people. First Chronicles 28, 8. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God, observe and seek out all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance to your children after you forever. So God was not so much concerned with the physical topography, but the people who live there. Now, when we look at the way God dealt with his people, we need to recognize that God both deals with us as individuals and as we are in relationship with one another as God's people. And the covenant that he makes is a covenant that extends to other people. In Deuteronomy 29, we find a covenant with the people being instigated by God. And by the way, we're, we'll come back to this. It's always by God's grace. He initiates. We don't go to God and say, have I got a deal for you? But rather, God comes to us and says, here's what I have to offer to you. He's the one who initiates. And this is Moses. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God. The heads of your tribes, your elders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who is in your camp. From the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today. Now notice, it's God who does this. And who's there? The rulers, the magistrates, well, and your servant who goes out and chops your wood and draws your water. Everyone's there. And God's the one who establishes the covenant. That he may establish you today as his people. And that he may be your God as he promised you. And as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So once again, this continuity, not a break, but an amplification and an affirmation. But notice what it says here. It is not with you alone that I am making the sworn covenant. But with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God, and with whoever is not here with us today. Now, let me ask you, if I say, I'm going to include everyone who is in this room, and I'm also including everyone who isn't in this room, who am I including? It's everybody. Future generations. We've got to recognize through this entire thing that the covenants, and God intimated this going back to the Garden of Eden when he was talking about how he would deal with Adam and Eve. It would spread to all. Or back to Noah. It spreads to all, or with Abraham's very specifically, in you will all the nations of the world be blessed. This covenant has implications for everyone. And then he lays out some background on this covenant. You know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. And you have seen their detestable things, their idols of wood and stone and silver and gold, which were among them. Beware, lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Now notice, 
the first point of this morning is a man. A man or woman. But then you move out. A clan. That's an extended family arrangement. A tribe a little bit further. Recognizing that we are in relationship. And we need to look at how we are functioning and whether we are God affirming or God denying. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of the sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall be saved though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. Uh, moist and dry is a reference to wood. Uh, you have the green wood, the moist. It doesn't burn very well. And then you have the dry that ignites very uh, pointedly. Um, Jesus uses that analogy when he talked about his own suffering and that he was going to go through turmoil and he said, if this happens to the green wood, referring to himself, what's going to happen to the dry? But here, God is saying, everyone's going to suffer. And you look at the history of Israel, and it was true. The evil suffered whenever the Babylonians came in and laid siege to Jerusalem. But those godly people who were caught in that, you think about the prophet Jeremiah. He suffered mightily through that whole time. So the guilty and the innocent will suffer when the wrath of God comes against a nation. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And the curses written in this book will settle upon him. And the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord will single him out from all the tribes of Israel for calamity in accordance with all the curses of the covenant written in this book. And the next generation, your children who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from a far land will say, when they see the afflictions that the land and the sickness with which the Lord has made it sick, the whole land burned out with brimstone and salt, nothing sown and nothing growing, where no plant can sprout and overthrow like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adama and Zebulun, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and wrath. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done this to this land? What caused the heat of his, this great anger? The people will say it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt and went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it all the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are this day. And then he closes. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So the principle of believing and obeying, and the curse that is pronounced to those who do not obey. Now, this covenant with the people and their land was confirmed at Shechem. Uh, Shechem is a, a town and a settlement in central Israel, in what we would refer to as Samaria. On uh, the north, it is uh, uh, 
surrounded. There are two crescent-shaped uh, mountains. Uh, to the north, we have <coughs> Mount Gerizim. To the south, Mount Ebal. And Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Cursing. Shechem's an important uh, place for many reasons. First of all, Abram, Abraham, built his first altar there. The first time he built an offer and set altar and sacrificed to God. Genesis 12, 6 and 7. Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring will I give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So the promise of the land was given to Abram and he built an altar there. Uh, Shechem was also important with Jacob. Uh, when Jacob traveled through, he purchased an inheritance there. And from the sons of Hamor, Genesis 33, 19, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he pitched his tent. And then it goes on to Joseph. Joshua 24, 32, as for the bones of Joseph, remember he was left, the book of Genesis ends with Joseph in a coffin in Egypt. Well, they eventually brought him back that when they returned, as for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. Now, in the Bible lands, there are a lot of things where you go. And depending on how uh, imaginative your guide may be, he might point out the sycamore tree that Zacchaeus actually stood in. And the very stone on which John the Baptist stood when he baptized Jesus. On the other hand, there are things there that you can look at, and some you can know in pretty good order. There are a handful of them that you can know you know, when you go through the tunnel in the old city of Jerusalem, you know, because that tunnel only will sustain one person walking by single file. And you know that David walked through there. You know you are stepping on the very place where David walked all that time ago. Well, this is one that is not quite that much, but pretty close. Because you have Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, you know where Shechem is. You can go there and you can say that this is the burial place. This, this is indeed where Joseph is buried. And you can also know this is where Jesus spoke to the woman at the well in Samaria. John 4, verse 5, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. So this is a very interesting place. But something that makes it interesting for our purposes is that Moses knew about this place. Now, how did Moses know? Well, in the ancient world, they did have cartographers, map makers, and they knew the topography of lands around where they lived. So Moses, being trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, likely would have had some understanding. And that's a possibility. The other is that it was through revelation that he was told what this land was going to look like. But something was predicted by Moses. Deuteronomy 11, beginning in verse 26. God says through Moses, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. 
the blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I'm commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not beyond the Jordan, west of the road, toward the going down of the sun, in the land of the Canaanites who live in Arabah, opposed to Gilgal, beside the Oak of Morah? For you to cross over the Jordan in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And when you possess it and live in it, you shall be careful to do all the statutes and rules that I'm setting before you today. So here's Moses, who seemingly had never been in the land of Canaan. If he had, we, we don't know anything about it. But he's revealing to the Israelites, when you go in there, there are going to be these two mountains. And one of them, Mount Gerizim, is the Mount of Blessing, and the other is the Mount of Cursing, Mount Evil. And when you go in, the people will go in, and half of them will be on Mount Gerizim, half will be on Mount Ebal. And as the law is read and the pronouncement of blessing and cursing is made, the ones on Mount Gerizim will affirm the blessing with amen. And the ones on Mount Ebal will offer the prayer of imprecation of amen. And remember, it's important that both are balanced. You know, Clay gives me a hard time because I studied the Psalms of imprecation. But the Bible, the Bible has both. And this is actually what happened in the days of Joshua. Joshua 8, 33 and 34. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native born, with their elders and officers and their judges. And once again, you see the, the corporate nature, the, the national nature of this with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that was written in the book of the law. Now, think about how dramatic that would be. We're talking about a pageant where the whole nation is on these two mountains, and in the middle of it, you've got the Ark of the Covenant. Now, it doesn't tell us whether the Shekinah, the presence of God, was hovering above it. It may have been. But we do know that all these priests with their, their garb, their robes, were all standing around. And as it was being read, the people were affirming the blessings and the curse. But we recognize in all of this, it is a covenant of grace. Deuteronomy 9, verse 6. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness for you are a stubborn people it's not because the israelites were so good that god said wow i've got to give them this land i've got to set up a covenant for them because wow if i don't if i don't get them some other god's gonna get them. no no there's one god there are many people but why would this nation be selected? It was God's grace. It wasn't their goodness. But grace is conditional. This is something we have to continually come back to. 
if grace is unconditional, there are only three possibilities. Either everyone's going to be saved, it's universalism, or nobody's going to be saved. Now, by the way, nobody puts that forward, but intellectually, that's the flip side of it. Or the third possibility is that God is capricious. That he looks out and says, well, Clay's going to eternal life. Uh, Brandon, uh, too bad for you. And just without any cause, just arbitrarily. Now, those are the only possibilities if grace is unconditional. But the Bible teaches us regularly throughout all the scripture that God's saving grace is conditional. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. So the love of God is super abundant and for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him, oh, the condition shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Doesn't say he so loved the world that he's giving the world everlasting life. He's giving the world the possibility in Christ. It's conditional. And the covenant of the land, of the nation, was conditional. As Joshua came to the end of his life in his final admonition, he tells the Israelites, but just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you if you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given you. We look at this and the realization that the covenant has consequences if you abandon it. We read of that in 1 Kings 14, 15. The Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the Euphrates because they have made their Asherim provoking the Lord to anger. But we find also that there is the word of grace and forgiveness. Second Chronicles 7.14 if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now, as we look at corporate Israel, national Israel, and the covenant which was lived out, we find that this really began with Moses and continued with Joshua and then with Judges and then with the kings. And as we look at this, with Moses, Joshua, and the judges, you had leaders who were in that position because they were the spokesmen for God. The kings could be, but they were not kings necessarily because they were. Now, the initial king of a dynasty in both Israel and Judah was selected by God. But then it was his son who would become king. And we find that there was an ongoing trend of apostasy, complete in the north and overwhelming in the south. But what about these kings? Well, Moses predicted 
that there would be kings in Israel. You know, we, we look at the circumstance that we'll glance at in just a moment with Samuel, where Samuel uh, was uh, persuaded, was, was forced to give them a king. But this wasn't something just out of the blue. God had told them that they were going to ask for a king, and he gave some restrictions. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And she, he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a book, a copy of the law approved by the Levitical priest, and it shall be with him. And he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them that his heart may not be lifted up among above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left so that he may continue long in his kingdom he and his children in Israel now you look at this there are a lot of interesting things in this one when you begin looking at the prohibition of basically uh, the poshness, the uh, uh, having lots of horses, which is just a way of saying living at large. In a more recent example, you look at France and Louis XIV was called the Sun King. He built Versailles and he lived large. In fact, he dominated culture and style throughout Europe. And then it was his grandson, Louis XVI, who lost his head. What happened? Well, instead of being focused nose to the grindstone on being a servant to his people. Now, in contrast to that, to pick an even more recent example, um, Elizabeth II is celebrating her Platinum Jubilee. And the British royal family has all kinds of problems. I know that. But I'm going to say this. The British people and peoples of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, throughout the British Commonwealth, they revere Elizabeth II because they have this picture of her in their minds of the daughter of the king standing on the balcony next to Winston Churchill during the dark days of the Second World War of a woman who actually went out and worked in the war effort and did not leave, you know, the, the, there was some question of shouldn't the royal family go to Canada where they can't be bombed? And the answer was no. Um, you look at what happened with the kings of Israel and Judah and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life destroyed them. But you look at this also. Something I find fascinating. 
he says, now, when you get a king, one of the things the king has to do, as soon as he starts to reign, he's supposed to sit down and copy for himself. Now, it could be that it means he has his secretary, his scribe, make a copy so that he has it in his, but the text says he shall make for himself. He shall make it. So whether he actually physically wrote it or he had it done, he was to have a copy of the law of Moses with him. And he was supposed to be reading in that thing all the time so that he would not disobey. Well, years later, Samuel gives them a king. Now, the circumstances, the last two judges of Israel were both great godly men, but their sons were rascals. And it was a scandal. And that had happened with Eli, but now it's happening with Samuel. And the people went to Samuel and they said, you're old. And your sons are worthless. And we don't want them. We want a king like nations around us. And, you know, you reach a point where you can, you know, you know you can pass from the scene. Clay's already told me since we've hired Brandon, I can just go and die now. It's all over. <laughs> he said, Greg, you're old. It's over. But that's what they said to Samuel. You know, and Samuel didn't take it very well. Uh, he did not like this. You're handling it well. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the ultimate thing, but when you look at the text... There was obviously, from Samuel's perspective, a personal slight that had occurred. And God said, uh, it isn't about you, Samuel. <laughs> Get over yourself. It's not about you. 1 Samuel 8, beginning of verse 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are also doing to you. In other words, God says, okay, Samuel, yeah, they aren't treating you well, but look at how they've treated me for all these years. This is the way it is. Now then obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. And Samuel lays it out. He says, this guy's going to be awful. And in part of it, he says, that he's going to disobey what Moses laid out. He's going to say he's this king's going to um, have all the pomp. And he's going to have all these chariots. He's going to do all this stuff. And then he goes in and he says, and you know what? He's going to tax you. And the taxes that he's going to give you are an enslavement. Do you know the outrageous taxes? It was 10%. And that was a curse. Often thought, oh, let me be cursed with 10%. It'd be fun. <laughs> but the point is, it was all laid out. And yet, we find in the Kings, the covenant was proceeding. Uh, next week, Clavon is going to be... Um, outlining the Davidic covenant. But again, as we started, we saw the progressive nature of, of covenants and the transition into the monarchy was foreseen by God. He, he said through Moses that he already knew it was going to happen. And even though it originated by the people 
losing faith in God to at least a certain extent. God used that and always had it in his plan for those kings in the ideal sense to be a picture of our savior. Now, no king lived up to that ideal, but the ideal by which you would measure kings was Jesus himself. Now, what are some principles from the national covenant that we could draw away from this lesson? Uh, first of all, there's a living out of the covenant. The law of Moses, the covenant given on Mount Sinai, was not merely an intellectual enterprise. It was lived out in the lives of men and women of faith. And as such, we can draw the lesson, of course, in our own lives that it's not enough to have intellectual assent to something. We are to submit. We are to humble ourselves before God. It's not that we earn our salvation. But if salvation is conditional and it's conditioned on penitent faith, that means our lives will be changed by that. We do find another principle, and we find this in all the covenants, that there's grace. God is the initiator. God is the one who does good for us. Um, if God wanted to condemn us, he wouldn't have to do anything. We've, we've given grounds of our, you know, it's not entrapment we've done it ourselves so if god if god had a hateful bent if he were not the god that we read of but if he was a if he was one of the capricious gods of the greco-roman pantheon all god would have to do is leave us alone and say okay you deserve to be destroyed but that's not what he does in point of fact he is in anguish. He is frantic. He is moving heaven and earth, literally. So we have an opportunity to be saved. God is the Savior. And yet grace is conditional. And it calls us to obedience. Uh, trusting and obeying if we truly believe that belief will make a difference in how we live it will change us and with all the covenants we find the element of judgment you look through scripture and the bible has actually if you look at it just word for word more to be said about condemnation than it does about the blessings of being saved. But part of that is you can't understand how good it is to be saved unless you understand the danger from which you are saved. The hymn Amazing Grace has the couplet, was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how marvelous did this grace appear the hour i first believed it's god's grace that he taught our heart to fear that he showed us what is wrong it's not loving to let someone go down a wrong path and not correct them. You know, I have a very good relationship with my, my physician. But when I go in and uh, he does the blood test and so forth, if, I, if I've not been observant in my diet and my blood sugar is off, would it be 
loving and kind for him to ignore that and say, oh, Greg, everything's great. Well, of course not. He looks at it and he says, okay, you're on this med. You know what? If you don't stop eating sugar, you're going to end up on insulin. Well, that's not what I want to hear, but it's what I need to hear. God tells us what we need to hear. And that is a word of judgment. God does not punish the wicked because he delights in it. Repeatedly in scripture, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone. God is not a sadist. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. But the wrath of God is against sin. So he gives a way of salvation. He provides the covenant. Those who enter into it have all the blessings God wants to give them. But those who reject the covenant have the assurance of judgment. Next week, Claybaum will be amplifying this with a continuation of the, the people of the land, the national covenant, but in spe specifically the promises given to King David.